There's a shadow on the rise. Hello and welcome to my channel. In this video we are discussing, that's right, The Shadow Rising Book 4 in The Wheel of Time, continuing with the great reread, uh, our official reread in the Wizardly Duo Discord. Once again, make sure to check the link in the description for the Discord uh, if you want to check out and join us on that buddy read. So this one I did, uh, as I've done the others, I've continued on with doing uh, the audiobooks, and I got through this one in just record time as well, so that was kind of nice. But The Shadow Rising, and I've alluded to this in a couple of the other videos uh, that I've, I've talked about too, but this is where we kind of really start to split out uh, and explore more of the world. The first three books are, are fairly... Uh, I don't want to say they're fairly formulaic, but they do follow the same kind of formula, the same kind of mold, uh, as we've talked about, where uh, we, we kind of have the characters. They sometimes split off a little bit, but they come back at the end. There's a, a big showdown, the good versus evil, and then we end the book. This one's quite different uh, because of the fact that we really start to spread out more so. We've got uh, three main different groups uh, that have really split out. Uh, and are doing very, very different things. And we also uh, have some other characters that we get a little bit more on the side where we're seeing what's going on in other parts and places as well uh, and start to kind of set almost the expectation of how the rest of the books are going to go. We're going to be spread out a lot more. We're going to be looking at new places and we're going to start to have more POVs from more uh, secondary characters uh, who are still relevant to the story. So this is kind of where that starts. This also, I've noticed a lot of people, uh, a lot of people say that this is their favorite book. And I think part of that's just because the first three, like I said, they, they feel a little more traditional. Uh, they also uh, follow that kind of formula. And this is the one that branches out. So it's really hard for me to pick an actual favorite Wheel of Time book. So I, I don't necessarily know, but this is a book that I quite enjoy. This gives us a lot of character development uh, for pretty much all of the characters. We get to learn quite a lot more about them, and we also get to explore multiple different places as well. Uh, and as you may or may not be able to tell from the cover in general, we get to see the uh, Aiel Waste. Said it right, just for you guys. After that video, everyone rads with me. Um, but we get to see more of that and learn more about the Aiel as well in this one. And this definitely still has uh, a very definitive climax. Uh, and, you know, still has that kind of thing going on, but it's not just like the, you know, big, like, avatar of good and evil fight. It's uh, more so, like, it's so important, uh, but also kind of setting up for, we're going to still have really big things, big events happening, but it's going to be quite a lot more going on. So that's kind of my uh, non-spoiler talk here to it. So now I'm going to talk spoilers. Uh, as always with these, this will be spoilers for The Shadow Rising and anything before The Shadow Rising, but nothing after The Shadow Rising. Normally it's hard for me to remember what happened in which book, but since we're doing the reread, uh, the specific events of each book are fresh, so that makes it much, much easier. All right, so uh, the the kind of the big thing, and I, I mentioned the Aeol Waste, is that that's the, the big push of where we're going, where Rand decides... He's going to go to the Aeol Waste because he is trying to fulfill the prophecies and make sure that he can bind the Aeol to him. So he's going, and they were looking for him, he who comes with the dawn, uh, and he's going specifically to try and fulfill those prophecies. Moraine, super not happy about this because she uh, wants him to go to Ilion and try to fight Samuel and go all of these different things. And she's like, why are you doing this? And she's not real happy about it. And Matt is basically forced to go because he's told that he will literally die if he does not. Uh, because, now the first aside of probably many, he and Rand as well go through the twisted stone doorway uh, into a, another place where they can ask three questions. So this is the, the first time that we see the Aelfin. Uh, and then we do see the Eelfin later. And... Um, I don't remember if those names are specifically stated in The Shadow Rising, but that's just what they're called. Um, that's not a spoiler, I promise. 
Uh, but uh, so they we, we get the first thing here. And so with asking the three questions and getting answers, although they're not necessarily the most easy to understand, and we get to see Matt go through, but not Rand. And then of course, later on, which we'll get there, uh, we see Matt go through uh, the other door uh, where he meets a different group of people and things work just a little bit differently. Uh, that whole thing as a concept is definitely something that I do want to do a dedicated video of. I haven't decided though if I want to wait until later to do it um, or if I want to do it kind of now so we'll have to see but at some point I, I will get a video of that done most certainly. So uh, with that though we see uh, Rand and Matt are going to be going uh, off to the IU Lace. Moraine is coming uh, and Egwene comes too because she wants to go seek out the wise ones to learn more about dreamwalking. Uh, meanwhile, Elaine and Nynaeve and uh, as well as Tom Marilyn and Julian Sandar decide that they need to go to Tanchico in order to hunt the Black Aja. And then we, we split up also with Perrin and of course Fael, I, you know, uh, uh, going to the two rivers because they have heard uh, there's lots of trouble there and there's white cloaks uh, and they get even more than they bargained for. So uh, the waste is definitely something that we focus on quite a lot. Uh, a lot of big things with Rand going through uh, the basically some sort of uh, terre en real that shows the history of the Aiel through the eyes of your ancestors. So since he is descended from the Aiel, uh, that's where we actually see his ancestry. But more than that, it's it's a really interesting way of delivering the history of the Aiel, which uh, you technically is an info dump. Yeah, I can't argue that it is technically an info dump, but it's done in an in-world way that I think works very well. It's interesting and it's very vital to the story, not only uh, the current story, and it tells a lot of, of things about the past, and we learn so much through it, too, because we get to see uh, the Age of Legends, get some glimpses there. Uh, we get to see the Tuathoan, uh, which is also something I, I've, I've thought about doing a video on in general as well, the traveling people, because there's more than you would think to talk about with them. Uh, and then we also get to see all kinds of different tidbits, and I, for one, found that fascinating the first time I read it, and I still enjoy it this time. I know some people may like it less, uh, but going through to become the Karakarn Karn uh, and the Chief of Chiefs, uh, and then going and trying to bind the Aiel to him, uh, and then we get the prophecy of he'll bind them to him and break them when he reveals to all of them that they uh, used to follow the way of the leaf, and then now became like some of the best warriors uh, on, on the planet. Uh, or at least the known world that we've seen here. So it's uh, it's a huge pivotal moment uh, of it as well, and it sets up quite a lot while also giving us a lot of information, so that's something that I, I really, really enjoy. Now, the guys and gals going to Tanchico uh, is, is quite different, and the thing that always sticks out the most to me uh, about the Tanchico chapters is the, the humor, because it is a little silly at points, but it just it works for me, and... Just one of my uh, absolutely favorite scenes of this book uh, is when uh, basically they, uh, <laughs> Elaine and I need to figure out uh, what's going on and they, they figure out where the uh, Black Aja sisters are. Uh, and then right after they do this, uh, then, you know, in comes. Uh, Julian and he's figured it out and then in comes Bale Doman and he, he's figured it out and they're mad that the others figured it out and one's a tyrant one's an early honor so they hate each other anyway and then Tom comes in and he's figured it out and it's just like every person's like they're all three of them are so mad that somebody else figured out what was going on before them uh, and it just is it's a great uh, comedic scene for me so that's a, a thing that definitely sticks out uh, and then we have a lot more uh, seriousness for sure uh, over in the two rivers where we see Perrin is the one who goes back and that's something that really speaks a lot to his character because Rand feels like he can't because that's he knows that that that's the point he, he knows that he, they're trying to draw him there basically and we see that with Padan Fane who's the one trying to draw Rand there specifically and he told him he was going to do it too 
But he, he knows he can't give into that because he's got to do, you know, bigger things, being the dragon reborn and all, uh, and trying to find his path. Matt, you know, feels kind of conflicted, but it's just kind of told, like, no, you have to go too. And so he doesn't really have to make that choice. But Perrin pretty unwaveringly goes and, and does what he sees as his duty. And that talks a lot to Perrin as a character. Uh, he's, he's steadfast and he's loyal. And he goes there, and I guess the... The kind of humor, uh, but even then it's it's done in a, a more serious way, is he kind of unofficially just becomes Lord of the Two Rivers because he goes in and he takes charge. Even though he's young and doesn't have a whole lot of world experience, he still has a lot more than most people there. And by coming in and just taking charge, uh, the, the people recognize that and specifically uh, start to follow him. Now, part two, we do see more moments of him being a Taviran, where uh, he's trying to talk people into like coming to stay in the town, and they think like it's never gonna work. But because he's a Taviran, it helps kind of prod them along. So there's definitely some of that too. More than that, though, I think it's just the fact that people are are recognizing his leadership and the fact he's taking control. And he, of course, hates it, doesn't want to be a lord, uh, but does what he needs to do. And we we have uh, some great battles and action there fighting uh with the trollocs and also the slayer in the wolf dream uh so there's a ton we see there as well um and we do also that's kind of the uh the the introduction of the whole uh luke isom thing which is is a whole uh, interesting thing that can be dug into as well uh with who that person is uh both both characters i'll say it that way have been mentioned previously mostly in very small ways uh but the so that's one of those very small things that you you might not even pick out if you didn't know uh but that is very intentional those two specific names uh, so let me know if you if you want to hear more about that i guess here too um but so we we see it quite a lot there it's a lot of growth for perrin uh, as well, and it, it just, like I said, it sets up quite a lot, and so I, I like that growth. This is, uh, we started getting, in the last book, we spent more time with Perrin, and we spent more time with Nat, and we spent a lot less time with Rand. This book goes back to having a lot more Rand, but it continues, while we still have Rand POVs, it continues to show Rand through other people's eyes as well. So when, uh, when we're seeing Matt's POV, a lot of times we're seeing Rand and we're seeing how everyone sees him. And he definitely comes off pretty crazy when you're seeing him through other people's eyes. He seems a, a lot more reasonable when it's his POV, but then you see other people uh, seeing him. And so I also love that it's done that way because you, you, this is a POV character. You get to get in his head and see what's going on. But then it's also you get a lot more information when you see him from the outside and, and see how other people see him. And so all of that, I think, works really well. Uh, and we were able to get a lot more Perrin and a lot more Matt uh, development in the last book. And we get a lot more uh, Perrin in this one. Matt does play some important roles, uh, but his character, I don't feel like, is developed as much in this particular book. Uh, but there's plenty more Matt to come. Uh, later as well along with all of the characters. We do spend some time with Min as well and we have some really large events happening in the White Tower even though that's technically like the side plot of the book in the White Tower we see Suan Sanche who's overthrown and deposed and El Elida takes control of the tower and is raised to Amarlin in her place and then Suan and her keeper Leanne and uh freaking Loghain, uh, escape with Min. We see that uh, Gon, because I'm still not saying Goblin, I just can't. Uh, we see Gon take the side of the Tower Loyalists and, and pit himself as an enemy of Suwan and potentially of Min. And so uh, an interesting development there as well. But so like that's a big thing that's happening. And that's a side plot because we have so much more also going on. And so... That, that's just another thing that I think works really, really well with Between the Waste, the Two Rivers, Tanchico. There's a ton there. Not to mention, I haven't mentioned that we, we get to learn a lot more about the Athan Mir uh, as well, the Sea Folk. And so that's another interesting thing. Also, if you're watching this, uh, let me know if you have caught uh, the Easter eggs, so to speak, in the like Hall of Wonders. There's actually several, like the Hall of Wonders in Tanchico and see how many... How many objects that are described you can identify uh, from this book because uh, there there's a lot of interesting things there that uh, in world the characters don't know what they are but you as the reader 
may be able to recognize them. So that's a fun thing. See how many things you can figure out what they actually are. Uh, as well, uh, we're looking at Tanjiko. Editing Nico here, because I forgot to mention two really big things. Uh, and I even said I was going to talk about one, but both happen to have to do with uh, Rudion, or kind of like toward the end of the book at least. But Matt going through the second uh, twisted doorway, and then that's where he then sees the Ilfin and going in and thinking he can try to ask his questions again, finding out that it doesn't work quite that way. Now, it's not explained fully how it does work, so I'm not going to get super into that, but he uh, ends up basically like unintentionally asking things, uh, saying what he wants, and gets the agreement. And so he ends up coming out with his Ashandari, the, like, type spear weapon type thing, uh, and a silver fox medallion uh, as well. And then he also, you know, is hung uh, from a tree because the, the payment was life uh, because of, of the things that he asked for. But uh, that's a really big thing uh, and is... is like the most probably integral part of Matt's story up to this point, barring like, you know, all the Shader Logoth stuff, but like him going forward, very, very, very important. So that's a big thing I should have mentioned. Also, we have uh, everything going on with, uh, I didn't really talk about the Shido uh, a whole lot too, but them trying to like go against Rand, which yeah, that'll, we'll, we'll see more of that too. But uh, with Lanfear and Asmodeon, who were both like undercover in the uh, merchant's wagon. And the plan being, Lanfear's plan apparently is for Asmodeon to teach Rand how to channel better. Uh, and so Rand ends up facing off against Asmodeon and defeating him. And then Lanfear uh, like shields him so he can, like partially shields him so he can only get a little bit of power out uh, and uh, does that. And then Rand still keeps from her. Uh, a little uh, type of uh, Tower of Griel that he doesn't want to have uh, that allow, basically, there's the male and the female ones that allow them to use very, very uh, large uh, saw on Griel. And so uh, also some really important things. So big things happening right at the end. I just wanted to come back and mention a little bit since I did not talk about them during. Uh, those were definitely some huge things that set up a lot more going, uh, and especially uh, just with, with Nat going forward as well too um it's as we get the further we get into the later books it's more so why i'm such a math fan i really like his later book plots so but anyway i just wanted to mention that back to the video um but really like i said a ton happens here a very very enjoyable book and this is where like i said the series really just starts to pick up steam uh it's we're going from here for a while we do have some slow books later but we're really picking up we're really starting to up the ante uh and get moving on with a lot more to come so i'm really excited i hope uh i i don't know how many people are still sticking with uh the read-along going on but i hope some of you still are uh and even if you're not and you've read it i hope you're enjoying all of the the wheel of time content because uh, i know some people who are not Part of the read-along have been watching all the wheel of time content so i always appreciate that as well those really are my thoughts though on the shadow rising make sure to give the video a like if you enjoyed it check the link in the description for the wizardly duo discord if you want to chat this book other books or really anything at all it is a lot of fun and we would love to have you of course if you enjoy my content make sure to subscribe <laughs>